advice would I have for somebody who wants to take on the U.S. federal government in court, playing by their rules? Don't expect to leave the conflict with anything other than maybe a good time. I'm a bird. It feels grand. Come fly the bird. Show your hands. <laughs> And don't think for a second that you're going to be the first person to use information released to the world by Manning, Snowden, or Assange as a way to challenge the U.S. government's claim to jurisdiction over your person. Because I was probably the first person to do that. August 2013. Now before you use data released to the world by Snowden, Manning, or Assange as a means by which you might fight against the U.S. government's claim to jurisdiction over your person, you should take note of the fact that the U.S. government is likely to label you as a domestic terrorist if you try this type of argument in federal court. Man, if you protest loudly against the duplicitous nature of the legal system maintained by the United States Department of Justice and then get lucky enough to get sued by a large publicly traded company, you too might find yourself hanging out in front of the White House protesting. Often people come up to me and ask me, what are you doing? So this is what I'm telling them now. What I'm doing when I fly the bird is I'm circumventing the NSA's ability to suppress data online. While the US does offer the most freedom of personal expression, we actually do not have a very free press. We're only rated number 48th in the world for our freedom of press. The U.S. government engages heavily in censorship. So freedom of expression personally and freedom of the press are actually two separate issues. And specifically, I am trying to keep a legal brief on the public record which goes like this. The U.S. government and all resulting jurisdictions in the absence of a human claimant to constitutionally protected rights does not have jurisdiction over my person because I can prove that the U.S. government is guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and consistent violations of the constitutionally protected rights of the residents of the lands under its control, and I can do this using evidence produced exclusively by the U.S. government. Now, I didn't set out to become a threat to the national security of the United States of America in the practice of pro se law. In fact, I was forced into the discipline of pro se law based on a lack of resources and that was a direct result of a failure to act on the part of a member of the Spokane Police Force. When I made my first report to the Spokane Police Department about crimes committed against my business in 2012, I didn't just notify the Spokane Police Department. I also notified the city's attorney, the U.S. attorney, the mayor's office, and the city council. But I didn't stop there. I contacted the police ombudsman. When the police ombudsman refused to act, I addressed city council. When city council did nothing, I posted a video online comprised of evidence I had collected. I sent the first check out and he texted me back saying, hey, I sent the order out, but you have to remake the check out. To and that check was made out on January 10th, um, 2012. And that check number was 2222. The first one I voided was January 5th, 2012, and it was for $265. So, and then I got emails saying that, you know, he was no longer with you, but he was a salesman, so he had um, extra product left over. February 13th, 2012, at 3.45 p.m., I said, I saw your email. Do you have any more batteries or stuff you want to sell and get rid of. I may buy some off yet. And he says, I'll email you what I can do, Ralph. And that was at 213 at 2012. Months later, when my business was still being destroyed by crimes committed against me that the Spokane Police Department refused to investigate, I resorted to video stings. 
so they're, it's exactly the same? Yeah, it's just... exactly the same. They just kind of changed. Okay. Now, one of these video stings resulted in a watered-down confession from one of the conspirators, but it was far more than enough to bury the masterminds, and still the United States Department of Justice refused to make contact with me, even after I served them with the evidence. This is the part where I began stamping Federal Reserve notes as a way of protesting. Now, the first website which received such attention was my killedbypolice.com website, and that was launched in direct response to the Spokane Police Department's failure to act in 2012. So, in 2013, when a Fortune 500 company came knocking on my door with a lawsuit this fucking big, I didn't have money for an attorney. So, I had to practice law for myself. All right, so everybody knows that the Federal Reserve is printing worthless paper, so they can't prove it's worth anything more than the cost of manufacture. Therefore, I have successfully argued in two federal jurisdictions that with the application of my website on this bill, it becomes more valuable. Because on my website, it's likely you'll learn something useful to you about the law. It's not going to cost you anything, and I don't generate any revenue from it. So, I actually submitted two samples to two different federal jurisdictions, explaining to them under penalty of perjury that I have in fact stamped 200,000 of these bills and ran around buying money orders to get them in circulation as a means by which to use Federal Rule of Procedure 103 Subdivision C, which states essentially, if information exists in the public space, then it can be used at your trial. Now, if I were wrong, would I still be out here 19 days Five hours a day, flipping off the White House? You tell me. When I first began protesting at the White House, I stood quietly at the fence line, smiling and flying the bird. However, after a couple more weeks of living on the streets while being ignored by the United States Department of Justice, I came up with my pitch for the alternative uses for Federal Reserve notes. And after a couple of Sundays passed without seeing my little girl, I decided to make coming to work a living hell for the staff of the executive building and the White House. All right, here we go. Here's another couple of guys that look like they need to learn something about the Federal Reserve. You ready? Gentlemen, can I teach you something about the Federal Reserve? Did you know that the Federal Reserve cannot prove that this dollar is backed with anything? I've actually proven this as a pro se litigant in two separate federal jurisdictions against two different tobacco companies. The argument goes like this. Because the U.S. Federal Reserve cannot prove that there's anything backing this particular dollar bill here, I've therefore made it more valuable with the application of my website because on my website it's likely you'll learn something useful to you about the law, it's not going to cost you anything, and I don't generate any revenue from it. So I'm actually invoking from the rules of federal procedure 103 subdivision C which states that if information exists in the public space, it's therefore usable at your trial. I want to thank you gentlemen for your time. Have a nice day. See, these guys don't like me, but they can't stop me because I'm actually telling the truth. About a week after my arrival in Washington, D.C., I had succeeded in developing a very annoying protest, but I still needed a method for attracting more attention from visitors to the White House. Lying at the White House, I will reach up to the stars. Hopefully Obama's working, not golfing out on Mars. By the bird, it feels grand. Come fly the bird, show your hands. <laughs> After I had developed my parody songs featuring Obama as the subject, I had no trouble being recognized all over Washington, D.C. Raise it up and flying out the White House. I'll raise it up for all the world to see. Criminals, they rule the U.S. government. Now words in silence never will be free. My business was destroyed by a failure to act on the part of the Spokane Police Department and a failure to uphold equal protection under the law by the United States Department of Justice. And that business was the only tool I had to be able to get across the state of Washington to see my kiddo. 
I drove across the state of Washington hundreds of times to see Abby. Consequently, I wasn't really concerned with how difficult I might have made life for employees of the White House and the Dwight D. Eisenhower Executive Building. What brought me here was a very long chain of events that start in 2009 when I first discovered that I had been exposed to large amounts of uranium and strontium. That was discovered through an elemental hair test in uh, July of 2009. So I decided to start studying closely U.S. federal policy to, you know, try to learn about the U.S. government because I figured that would have been the most likely source of my exposure. These elements don't exist in nature at sufficient levels or even at all to, uh, you know, suggest that uh, that I would be naturally exposed to that type of level of radioactivity. Now, everybody has some radioactivity in their bodies based on the fact that there's been tons of atmospheric testing, you know, ever since the devices were first developed. But that being said, my exposure is about 80 times higher than what you would expect to see. So, one of the things that I ended up studying was the nuclear industry. And I posted a piece online in 2011 where I evaluate the industry and determined that the U.S. federal government's actually giving to the nuclear industry about $2.5 billion a month in subsidies. This is, comes in the form of uh, cleanup activities, securement, research, you know, paying out settlements when people were injured, like active duty soldiers that were exposed to radiation, things like that. And, and by this point, I had written my first book about U.S. federal policy. Uh, that's when America's intelligence community became actively involved in my life, it appears, for uh, most of my former contacts were intimidated into not maintaining contact with me. So I came here to Washington, D.C. to basically make myself top dog, paint myself the target for the intelligence community, and show them what you know intelligence is about. I'm going to make them work, creating quality jobs in the public sector. I was a job creator in the private sector, and now I've come here to create jobs in the public sector. It might sound excessively paranoid for me to claim to have long been a target for harassment by America's intelligence community, but courtesy of Judge Adalia A. Hill of Adams County District Court, I was able to collect evidence to support my claim in the spring of 2014. The police report submitted to the court is false by omission. That's my testimony. I'm not sure what that means, false by omission. Well, I, I guess uh, if you can't read, Your Honor, I've submitted a full written report on the subject, but the, the report is I'm false by omission. I'm testifying now because it, when you The appeal, officer made a jurisdictional decision on the side of the highway, which was not discussed in the report. What jurisdictional decision? Well, the officer in question. Uh, observed that I was smelling, had the odor of cannabis, and asked me if I had consumed cannabis on that day. I responded that yes, I had in fact smoked cannabis on that day, and then when the officer proceeded to uh, make motion that he was going to ask me to come out of my car, I responded by explaining to him that he doesn't have jurisdiction over me because I can prove that the U.S. government's guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and consistent violations of the constitutionally protected rights of the residents of the land under its control, and I can do that using evidence produced by the U.S. government. He then stopped, said, okay, turned on his heel, walked back to his car, and made no mention of cannabis in that ticket whatsoever. Therefore, it's incomplete and inaccurate by omission, Your Honor. He made a jurisdictional decision on the side of the highway. And I'm assuming you're purporting that the omission is that he didn't charge you with possession of cannabis? I'm, I'm reporting this to the court because it's dangerous to have law enforcement officials running around with either incomplete uh, training or, or a lack of knowledge of the law. Clearly, this officer was not fit to, uh, uh, to exercise any kind of duty on that day. Okay, so the testimony you want the court to consider regarding this um, speed infraction would be what? That your officer in question has submitted a false report to the court. And it actually stands as, as evidence that the officer in question is not competent to hold the position that he's currently receiving compensation from the taxpayers of the state of Washington to do. All right. Mr. Evans, any questions for clarification? Uh, no questions, Your Honor. All right. Um, 
Um, anything further you wish to offer on your own behalf? Oh, I really enjoyed the, being in the courtroom today, Your Honor. Now, what was not evident in that courtroom recording was a whisper which occurred between Judge Hill and the clerk of the court. Yeah. But what the court would uh, also find that the state has not offered certification of that particular speed measuring device. There's no um, affidavit certifying by the state expert that this particular radar uh, device was certified to be in proper working order on the date of the stop as required. So Judge Hill did not read my brief in support of the rights of the sovereign entity. And when I failed to yield to her claim of jurisdiction, she became quite desperate to get me out of her courtroom. Desperate enough to commit perjury. Need some proof? Thank you very much. You helped out as long as he's um, out of the courthouse. As long as he is. I'm sure he's. Is he out of the building? He should be. He's walked downstairs. Okay, thank you very much. It was very helpful. I submitted to the Federal Bureau of Investigations. The evidence to support my claim regarding perjury committed by Judge Adalia Hill in Adams County District Court and the FBI's failure to respond to that evidence is part of what led to my job search in Washington, D.C. later that year. At uh, 13 minutes into that, you can hear her actually commit a felony. Oh, really? Yeah. There's actually proof right on there. He's the prosecutor's covering for it. So that's why he just walked in and then saw me and I just bolted right back out. What did you say before? At uh, 13 minutes in, you can actually hear the judge commit a felony. It's pretty funny. Anybody else want to look? <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, I got this particular judge on a felony. This one, yeah. Using evidence from this courtroom. <laughs> oh, about a thousand. <laughs> going to take on any serious political issues such as you know, problems with the legal system, or excessive use of force by officers, criminality within the U.S. government, you definitely want to have a handle on how to have a conversation with a law enforcement professional. So there's no one in particular you want to talk to that's in the State Department? Not within the State Department, sir. I'm strictly okay. here to use my skills in game theory to absorb department resources. Uh, my, my actual department that I would like to speak with is someone in the United States Department of Justice, but I've had extensive communications with that department for the last two years. I've lost all confidence that there's anyone in there that actually cares about the fact that the department violated my right to equal protection under the law. As such, I don't think it's reasonable for me to waste my time going over there at this point. So I'm, I'm strictly here in Washington, D.C. to educate people on various matters relating to U.S. federal policy and use of the legal system to absorb resources belonging to the U.S. government by basically getting employees to talk about the fact that there's some guy out here flying the bird. I'm also circumventing the NSA's ability to suppress data online by getting my picture taken an average of a thousand times in front of the White House on a daily basis, which has actually been quite effective. And I'm using the increased traffic on my website to hopefully augment an international job search so that once I finally figure out how to get out of the USA, I'll have a job and I won't have to come back. And mind if I ask your name? Chance Addison, sir. Chance? Yes, sir. C-H-A-N-C-E. That's correct. Addison is A-D-D. Uh, what were we talking about again? Uh, 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 Addison. A-D-D-I-S-O-N. -S yeah. So how long do you plan on being today, this morning? Uh, just until the employees have gone through, and it kind of looks like you've got a diplomatic visit going, so I might leave after it appears as though there's uh, events of less significance occurring. So, uh, you know, so, I'm a little opportunist in that. So you're going to be here for a while, you're saying? Well, I, you're telling me then that they're going to be here for a while? I'll I be no here idea. for a while. I have no idea. Well, I, you know, if it looks like there's something significant happening, I'll be here. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty well known. There's a, a yesterday, actually, a couple of... DNS of DHS officers came back, two of them which were there in attendance on the first day, and uh, gave me a short interview, double checking, making sure I'm okay, you know, asking me if I needed any help, any, any mental 
health services. And I pointed out to him that I'm actually probably in better mental condition than most of the employees working for the U.S. government based on the looks on their faces when they're going to work. So I, you know, I'm all right as far as that goes. I have no, no intention of entering the building, no intention of breaking any laws, no intention of hurting myself or others. I'm not armed. I've renounced violence. I do not condone violence. And, and where are you living now? In my car. In your car. Where is it? Outside of the district. I was uh, awoke multiple times by D.C. Metropolitan Police, and it seemed as though someone had given them instructions to do so, thinking that, you know, getting me short on uh, sleep was going to actually change anything, which it did not. Gosh, you're blocking my view now. Darn it. It's kind of ruining the game. Can, I, can we move over on the other side of the booth, sir? Does that be all right? I prefer to stay right here if you don't mind. Well, I understand, but I do have a right to protest and be seen. So can we move just over there if you don't mind? Thanks. Much appreciated. <clears throat> Morning, sir. Yesterday, the uh, two DHS officers did inquire uh, as to whether I was communicating with employees, and I did tell them I do give people a good morning or you look great or something like, of that nature, and they were curious to know if anyone was responding to me, and I told them that generally, no, it was just polite hellos or, or whatnot, so they were concerned to make sure that I was not interacting hostily, and I do not do that. I tried to be the most polite man in Washington, D.C., especially in light of my finger, because obviously it would be counterproductive to what I'm doing if I were to be hostile, angry, any of that stuff. So I'm, I am actually probably the most polite man in Washington, D.C. And in fact, I don't even litter, sir. Well, taunting the U.S. government and one of the world's largest companies in federal court was a really great time, but I wouldn't recommend such pursuits for anyone that's got any assets or any concern with possession of assets, because at the end of the day, you're probably not going to have any. Uh, now, when I decided to go ahead and start poking the bear, as it were, I was already broke as a joke. It's three months late on my house payment. So when I saw, you know, inches worth of uh, legal filings coming at me from a Fortune 500 company, I figured, well, I didn't have any chance in hell, so why not have a little fun, right? No, I am not. I am giving you the information you requested. Do I totally represent all the laws of the Internal Revenue Service, sir? No, I do not. Well, this is this is a collection call, my dear. You. This is a collection call. I need to speak to someone with authority then, please. Number 0270510. How may I help you? I am uh, calling in reference to a letter received from the Internal Revenue Service. I'm looking to see if there's actually an identifying uh, notice CP80. Okay, what is it concerning? Uh, it says here that it's stating that your agency owes me $7,600, and I'm calling to claim that claim that money. Yes. Okay. Can you please hold for a moment? Absolutely. For the record, it's uh, June 16th, 2014. Time is 11 a.m. exactly. Been on hold for about a half hour. And I did receive a letter from the IRS recently. It's stating that I have a credit on account of $7,600. In relation to my previous renunciation of citizenship, which is retroactive to the date of my birth, uh, this means that this $7,600 is mine. Now, I'm trying to be consistent with all of my previous legal communications with the U.S. Department of Justice, and so in keeping with all of my prior communications with the U.S. government, I am now going to demand that the Internal Revenue Service return $7,600 to me. This is going to be fun. Of course, all of this is going to go down while I vaporize massive quantities of cannabis oil. Okay, sir, thank you for holding. Absolutely. Okay, that notice also tells you you need to file your return for 2011. Actually, ma'am, I need to let you know that I am recording this communication. 
and pursuant to civil case number 1 colon 1 3 CB 210 Reynolds Innovations Inc v Addison et al in the middle district of North Carolina I am calling to reclaim these assets for I renounce citizenship and claim the legal status of sovereign entity therefore these assets belong to me I do not owe you any tax return. There is not a tax return forthcoming. I am not a U.S. citizen. I'm not going to be a U.S. citizen any longer, ever. I Actually, my citizenship was terminated October 15, 2012. Your agency, this letter was received in response to my notice of sovereignty, which I can read to you now, since you probably don't have it handy. Uh, it's uh, dated May 19th, 2014. The title is Notice of Sovereignty and Demand for Reimbursement, Chance Addison, S.E. To the Internal Revenue Service, P.O. Box 255, Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. This is a call that I've made to the IRS on June 16th, 2014. The battery on the video actually crapped out in the middle of my delivery of my my speech to the IRS. Uh, that being said, the agent immediately put me on hold while she's referring to the content given. I'm expecting this is going to take some amount of time, but I wanted to go ahead and document the, the video failure while I'm sitting here still on hold waiting for the agent to return. So nothing in, in essence has been missed. For all I was doing was reading from legal communications previously sent to the IRS May 19th. In fact, the agency only has two days left to comply with my legal notice. If it fails to wire to me $7,600 by uh, Wednesday this week, I will have established my right to proceed in international court against the IRS. Here she is. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for holding. Yes. Okay. Now, you have written it to the service center, correctly? Correct with your notice. The address to which I communicated with the IRS previously was P.O. Box 255, Memphis, Tennessee, 38101-0255. Okay, and we responded back to you asking that you file that tax return. I am a sovereign entity. You do not have a claim over any of my assets, and I've already sent you a written communication uh, by registered service, U.S. Postal Service, return receipt required, that states that I've given your agency 30 days to return my assets. That 30-day period ends on Wednesday this week. That is two days from today. Okay, sir. Well, you will not be receiving a refund in two days from today. Okay, well, I, I, wanted just, I just wanted to affirm that on record because I am planning on pursuing this in international court. So you've, you've been notified. Okay. I will notate that on your account for you that you did call in, and you will be pursuing your case in international court. So hold and, on a moment, okay? Okay, and would you also please state for the record again your ID number? 027-0510. And you are claiming to speak on behalf of the Internal Revenue Service on this matter, correct? No, I am not. I am giving you the information you requested. Do I totally represent all the laws of the Internal Revenue Service, sir? No, I do not. Well, this is this is Again, a collection call, my dear. This is a collection call. I need to speak to someone with authority then, please. Sir, no one can release that refund. The uh, only are you saying, well, then you're saying you speak you for the IRS. You, fo you followed the correct procedure by writing in to the service center. Now, once they, they receive that notice, and they're going to respond back to you in writing. And I have acknowledged that With I've received a re I have received a piece of writing, and you've acknowledged that I've received it. So now we're getting to the point where uh, either put me to someone who can speak to the IRS, or acknowledge the fact that you are speaking on behalf of the Internal Revenue Service. Sir, hold on, okay? Thank you. Uh huh. Bump it. I can take your phone number and have a manager give you a call back if you like. Okay. Now, often I would tell visitors to the White House that it was the duplicitous nature of the legal system maintained by the United States Department of Justice which led to my presence in Washington, D.C. Now, sometimes that would lead to a discussion about policy. Why are you against uh, 
nuclear power? Well, actually, because uh, it, act, it, first of all, the U.S. government's violating federal law in every one of its nuclear facilities to store radioactive waste improperly uh, in violation of federal procedures for such storage. Further, the federal government subsidizes the nuclear industry to the tune of two and a half billion dollars per month, which according to the industry itself, equates to approximately 50% of the industry's contribution to the GDP of the United States of America. Then you have the issue that the 100 plus civilian reactors, all of them have leaked. And then also the fact that there are much safer technologies that don't require the building of multi-trillions of dollars worth of unfunded liabilities like you see in Fukushima right now, where originally the estimates for cleanup were in the hundreds of billions, and now the Japanese government is talking about 10 trillion or more in unfunded liabilities. The Government Accountability Office here in this country declared to the public many, many years ago that the U.S. government lost five tons of highly enriched materials. Lost them. That's enough for a hundred bombs, the equivalent of what they dropped in Japan back in 1945. That could devastate a whole country. And they didn't do anything about it. There was no activity. When I looked at that in 2011, they had done nothing in 10 years or more. Yeah, he's stoned and function, I will harass him. For a network to function as a weapon against the U.S. government, all they have to do is tell the truth. So the, the stories that the government here doesn't want to cover are the ones that RT will pick up because, you know, feeds that portion of the public that's looking for that information. So, you know, that's that's how bad the press state, the state of the press here has become. That, you know, you can actually use truth as a weapon. It is pretty bad. I mean, it's a sorry state of affairs. If we had some reform of broadcasting standards here, then the major networks wouldn't function as an extension of part of partisan politics, and that would really help people to actually know what's going on. But the people that run the U.S. government really don't want people in this country to know what's going on. They would rather they just be entertained by whatever else is going on, and that's why I try to make this entertaining. Well, the needs a sign. Let him know we're here. So take your fingers, raise them up, and pierce the atmosphere. He needs to know that things are really screwed up. It's like an ugly video where he's two girls and we're the cup. <laughs> girls one cup, and I didn't even swear. Why? Because the Secret Service told me on video four days ago they were going to shoot me cold blood in the street if I dropped another F-bomb. You bet you can find that on YouTube because there's four cameras pointing at him at that time. Wow. Yeah. Why? Because members of law enforcement in this country are allowed to shoot an unarmed person and they will get a paid vacation 99.9% .9 of the time. 1,000 people are murdered in this country every year by law enforcement and when you look at the evidence, if any regular citizen did that same action, they would be serving term for murder or at least manslaughter at minimum if they had the resources to buy down the charges. And that's how the legal system works. If you can pay for representation, you can generally get a pretty easy ride. One example, a member of the DuPont family a couple of years back got busted for molesting a three and a half year old. But the judge said prison would be such an unhealthy environment for him that they didn't even send him to prison. Yeah. Or that kid in uh, Texas a couple years back, affluenza was his defense. He was so wealthy that he couldn't be expected to not drive drunk. And they let him off on that. Wow. So yeah, if you can buy justice, it's for sale. However, U.S. citizens will tolerate that. They'll tolerate all that and more. Leaders guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and consistent violations of their rights. America wasn't built by U.S. citizens. It was built by Americans, and they won't put up with that shit. I'm an American. My efforts in the field of education weren't just limited to tourists at the White House. I was actually helping the staff members of the president himself to come to a deeper understanding of the alternative uses for Federal Reserve notes. Good morning, sir. I'm here to educate people on the alternative uses for Federal Reserve notes. As it turns out, because the U.S. government cannot prove that Federal Reserve note is worth anything more than the cost of manufacture, it's totally legal to use them to invoke Rule 103, Subdivision C from the Federal Rules of Procedure. If I were wrong about that, 
Would I be out here on day 30 with this level of charm? Probably not. In fact, I even testified under penalty of perjury that I stamped 200,000 Federal Reserve notes in an effort to invoke Rule 103, Subdivision C from the Federal Rules of Procedure, which states information in the public space may be used at your trial. And yes, the feedback is intentional. Why? Because the U.S. Department of Justice committed against me in 2012 a denial of equal protection. Therefore, I'm going to make sure you spend more on hearing aids than it would cost to settle this issue with the U.S. DOJ. By the time the IRS started sending letters to me, it was early in 2014, I had long since renounced my citizenship using Facebook. That was October 15, 2012. And thereafter, I had been brought into federal court by a Fortune 500 company. So, obviously, I had to remain consistent to the contents found in my written testimony. So you know where this is going, right? Okay, how can I help you? Well, I recently received a response from the Internal Revenue Service. On May 19th, 2014, I sent to the Internal Revenue Service a notice of sovereignty and demand for reimbursement, and the agency responded with a CP80 form acknowledging that I do have a credit on account of $7,600. Uh, you do not have a tax return forthcoming from me as I am not a U.S. citizen. Therefore, this is a collection call with the goal being that I am trying to collect my $7,600. According to the 30-day period outlined in my notice of sovereignty and demand for reimbursement, today is the end of the 30-day period which I outlined in, in terms of the Internal Revenue Service returning to me my personal assets. So I wish to speak with someone who has the authority to speak legally on behalf of the Internal Revenue Service so that we can finish this matter today. I am recording everything that's being said on my end as well as on yours. And uh, I'm, you, you filed a bankruptcy? Uh, that was in 2010, discharged in 2010, January. Uh, so this is that's a completely separate matter. This has to do with payments made after that time. Uh, in relation to my former social security number. My citizenship was terminated October 15, 2012, and that's a matter of federal record. I can confirm you $7,600, but as far as the rest of us is concerned, I don't know anything about that. Uh, Would you do me the kind service of getting me to somebody with the authority who can speak on behalf of the Internal Revenue Service? I had scheduled two days ago a call back from a manager, and the lady that I was conversing with previously said a manager would call, and today being the last business day, uh, uh, you know, forming the expiration of the collection period, I really need to speak to someone with authority today. Okay, now when you talk to us on the 16th of June, which is two days ago, then advise me that you to file a tax return to claim that credit. And what I responded with is that it's already a matter of federal record that my citizenship has not existed for nearly two years. I'm therefore not legally required to submit any further paperwork with the Internal Revenue Service. The goal being today that I'm trying to preserve the chain of evidence so that I can initiate a case in international court against the Internal Revenue Service should the agency fail to return my money by the end of business today. So I need to speak with someone with legal authority, please. Okay, hold on. I would sure appreciate your help in this matter. And that wasn't the last communication I had with the IRS. In fact, the Bureau did send to me two checks, the sum total of which was far less than the amount indicated on this CP80 I had received from the Bureau a few months earlier. So I went ahead and sent the checks back. But I did it my way. As it turns out, the IRS wasn't the only quasi-government agency with which I had to remain consistent. And what agency it is you're calling from? My name is Erin. I don't have an employee ID, and I'm calling from Premier Oh, excellent. And uh, what is it you'd like today? I need you to verify your date of birth, your address, or the last four of your social night, so I have more information why we're calling. Why do I care? 
because I'm calling to help you out today. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a suitcase full of money for me or something? I do not, but I would like to go oh. over this personal business center with you, and if you are not able to verify your address, the le- your date of birth, or the last four digits of the social security number, we will not be able to help you out with this information. Well, I mean, it doesn't sound like you have anything that you're going to give me. Uh, it sounds more like you would like me to give you something. I don't actually have anything. I could actually verify any of those metrics that uh, you named as being vital to continuing the conversation, but I've found I've, I don't have any interest so, so far. I mean, you haven't really told me that there's anything in this for me. Okay, well, I'm calling in regards to your student loans, Chan. Oh, well, uh, here's the deal, actually. Uh, yeah. Because the U.S. government can be proven to be a criminal organization guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and consistent violations of the constitutionally protected rights of the residents of the lands under its control, and these things can be proven with evidence produced exclusively by the U.S. government, I am therefore constitutionally protected from being forced to do business with you on this matter. Okay, and that's perfectly fine. You can refuse to give out your date of birth, and that's your choice. No, actually, it's my human right not to be forced to give renumerance to a criminal organization. Now, the U.S. government can be proven to be a criminal organization, guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and consistent violations of the constitutionally protected rights of the residents of the lands under its control, and these things can be proven with uh, evidence produced exclusively by the U.S. government. So, therefore, I have the human right not to be forced to participate in a criminal transaction, Therefore, please delete me from your database. Okay, I will remove your number so you don't get any more calls from us. Have a good night, Chan. Thank you. And that's how to deal with your delinquent student loans. My renunciation of U.S. citizenship via Facebook wasn't the only precedent that I set in the legal system. All right. Everybody knows that the U.S. government is not backing this dollar with anything more than the cost of manufacture. But knowing something and proving it in court are two different things. So, in in fact, in court, I've proven that if, in fact, there's any gold in Fort Knox that no longer belongs to the American people. Are you ready for this? All right. I've argued as a pro se defendant in federal court facing two different tobacco companies in two different federal jurisdictions that because the U.S. government cannot prove this bill's worth anything more than the cost of manufacture, I actually make it more valuable with the application of my website because on my website, it's likely to learn something useful to you, it's not going to cost you anything, and I don't generate any revenue from it. So I testified under penalty of perjury to these two different federal courts that I in fact stamped 200,000 of these bills in an effort to use from the federal rules of procedure, rule 103, subdivision C, which states information in the public space may be used at your trial. So if I were wrong about that, having sent them stamped samples, would I be out here in front of the White House on day 39, flying the bird an average of five hours a day? You tell me. You remember this strategy? Gentlemen. After a few days of my video work on Pennsylvania Avenue, it seemed as though a large portion of the president's staff had begun arriving to work wearing street clothes while carrying a bag. Even the Secret Service began to show some wear and tear by the middle of September. They had complained to me copiously about the complaints they were receiving from tourists who were angered by my display. This is probably a good time for some corrections and additions. You remember I was talking about how my falling out with the U.S. government occurred around 2009? Actually, it goes back quite a bit farther. You see, I was one of the few people in America who was at the time paying attention to the fact that the George W. Bush administration apparently set out to commit intentional crimes of war in the nation of Iraq. Do you think that the U.S. or U.N. forces should have moved into Baghdad? No. Why not? Because if we'd gone to Baghdad, we would have been all alone. There wouldn't have been anybody else with us. It would have been a U.S. occupation of Iraq. None of the Arab forces that were willing to fight with us in Kuwait were willing to invade Iraq. Uh, Once you got to Iraq and took it over and took down Saddam Hussein's government, then what are you going to put in its place? That's a very volatile part of the world, and and if you take down the central government in Iraq, you can easily end up seeing pieces of Iraq fly off. Uh, Part of it uh, the Syrians would like to have to the west. Uh, Part of eastern Iraq uh, the Iranians would like to claim fought over for eight years. Uh, In the north, you've got the Kurds, and 
the Kurds spin loose and join with the Kurds in Turkey, then you threaten the territorial integrity of Turkey. It's a, it's a quagmire. A year after that television interview, former Vice President Dick Cheney became the CEO of Halliburton, and years later, when he was campaigning under President Bush for re-election, I was accusing the Bush administration of war crimes and having produced and selling hundreds of t-shirts advertising that fact. On the 17th day of my protest, the Secret Service ended up catching me a couple blocks away from the White House in my car. Now, they issued to me several citations. However, several months later, I had not yet heard back from the municipality of Washington, D.C. Now, I wonder if that had something to do with my serving to that municipality, my brief in support of the rights of the sovereign entity. In fact, I was traveling with a copy, so all I had to do was pull the cover off. In addition to receiving a copy of my 274-page legal brief, the District of Columbia's Department of Motor Vehicles also received from me a boilerplate response to the citations issued to me by the Secret Service. And I made mention of the fact that I had captured some video evidence. Badge number, sir. You're using taxpayer resources. Can I have your badge number, please? So you're refusing to uh, offer your badge number? How do I even know you're an officer of the law? You might be impersonating an officer of the law. That's actually a growing crime. Well documented. I'm going to have fun in court. Thank you. Much appreciated. Everybody out. I was in front of the White House when Omar Gonzalez jumped the fence in September 2014. And from that event, I collected yet more evidence of censorship on the part of the press here domestically because I sent out written testimony to 10 elected officials and departments within the United States government and a month later when the security events at the White House were still absorbing a significant portion of the news cycle no mention of the pictures I collected of my relocation of temporary barricades on Pennsylvania Avenue to affect the protocols for the incoming presidential motorcade on September 19th, 2014. I even sent out four dozen copies of my potential congressional testimony to the national media in Washington, D.C. And you remember that time I was on a phone call with the IRS and got caught smoking a little grass on video? Well, that's neither the first nor the last time. It is 6.55 p.m., September 5th, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, Washington, D.C. And I am daring anybody to debate with me the drug war and claiming it is my constitutionally mandated duty to resist any law which can be proven to have weakened the national security of the United States of America. Now, I can prove that cannabis laws have, in fact, weakened the national security of the United States of America. I can prove that to anybody. Notice that uh, nobody's willing to debate me at this time. The Secret Service agents stationed outside of the White House were probably not the only group of people that found my protest annoying. In addition to employees at the IRS, the Department of State, and members of the President's staff, it's very likely that the executives of the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company of North Carolina found my work in the court system extremely irritating. Now that irritation probably first began in October 2013 when I first submitted to the court for the Middle District my assessment of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution for the United States of America. Thereafter, the legal representative to the company received from me fun Christmas gifts and an office visit. Now that office visit resulted in their legal representative filing against me a restraining order, even though I committed no crime on the premises. So I used that restraining order to my advantage by saving money on the cost of legal service to their legal representative when I delivered to the court system an entire book in response to the lawsuit filed against me by Reynolds Innovations, subsidiary to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And you remember how I was recording phone calls when I first observed criminal acts committed against my business in 2012? We're getting ready to form the first Oklahoma chapter of a vapor association. 
okay? Yeah. Here's what we're going to do. Now, you might try to do the same thing. You, I'll give you something. I'll throw you a bone here. You probably already thought about it, maybe. But I told the, I told my partners, we had our meeting two weeks ago. I said, here's what we're going to do. I said, we're going to form the first association, Vaping Association of Oklahoma. And uh, I said, what we're going to do is we're going to get with these senators. We're going to have to bust our ass on this. And we're going to make it where we have the tightest freaking uh, requirements to make this stuff. I said, we're going to form this thing. And I said, we need somebody like my wife or something, somebody else outside our company to form it and be the head, right? Mm. Where we disassociate the company from it, but but we have an insider in it. You see what I'm saying? Well, we're sure. going to make that. We're going to we're going to our trailer. We have the health department guy that's going to go look through this trailer. It's going to be it's all stainless steel. It's masked. It's everything. Okay, we're going to make this so tight like you could perform surgery in it. Okay, dude. And what we're going to do is once we get that thing squared away real tight. Then we're going to form this association, and we're going to act like we're going to put the requirements on us. We're going to make it so stringent on us, but we're already going to be there. And we're going to make these legislators down here at the Capitol start to wake up, and but we're going to wake them up, but we're already going to be prepared for it. Yep, we're going yep. to be the ones in Oklahoma that are making it right under the quote-unquote rule. Now, at the time of that phone call, that man was claiming to be the owner of five retail tobacco stores, making him one of the largest retailers of the products belonging to R.J. Reynolds Tobacco in the state of Oklahoma. Now, the company's executives probably didn't appreciate my recording of that phone call very much, but you can bet they despised my challenge to the corporate charter belonging to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. The basis of that challenge was the fact that the company's executives have knowingly produced and made available to the marketplace a product which has no known health benefits, but when used as directed, invariably harms and possibly even kills the user. I didn't stop with my challenge to the corporate charter belonging to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. I took the extra step of labeling the Master Settlement Agreement as evidence of a conspiracy between the U.S. government and the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company to abridge my sovereign rights. The argument's pretty simple. The Master Settlement Agreement prevents the taking to court of tobacco companies by consumers harmed by tobacco products. And the Master Settlement Agreement, signed during my lifetime, does not bear my signature thereupon. Now, some people might think it was crazy of me to take on the maker of Camel Cigarettes in federal court. Some people might say that I made myself a target for harassment by the U.S. government. However, I proved early in 2012 that I was a target, and I did it by busting a gang of criminal conspirators. And when the police did nothing about the evidence I collected, I turned it into a video so that everybody could enjoy the knowledge that I am possessed.
the start of 2012, I had terminated my business dealings with R.J. Hampton and his fictitious company in response to the criminal acts he and his partners were committing against me. He was at the time colluding with my former product representative and the owner of several local stores to sell product which infringed on my federally protected trademark rights. After the Spokane Police Department ignored my police report, this gang of criminals went on an even greater crime spree. The first version of the music video you just watched was created a month after the Spokane Police Department failed to uphold the law. That first copy featured audio from Hampton's ex-wife, which originally accompanied the video now on screen. Video which is comprised of evidence proving RJ was committing at the time not only trademark infringements against my company, but also tax evasion and perjury in family court. I had delivered promptly this information to the authorities as a means by which I could encourage RJ and his partners to cease and desist in their illegal activities. Production of that music video and the video stings performed in the stores owned by one of their partners were still far cheaper activities than my remaining alternative. I had visited a Spokane-based trademark attorney in February 2012 and found myself unable to foot the bill. This was the same problem which eventually led me into the field of law when I faced R.J. Reynolds' tobacco in federal court, much to the annoyance of the United States Department of Justice. The music video I produced in 2012 wasn't the only piece of custom media I produced that year. In fact, when the United States Department of Justice refused to respond to my communications with that department, I went ahead and came up with the idea for producing the author's special section package, which I went ahead and delivered to the Department of Justice, along with a copy of my written testimony in the summer of 2012. Now, the author's special section package included evidence of mail fraud, felony theft, embezzlement, invasion of privacy, and conspiracy to commit trademark infringements against my company. It also included evidence of the fact that there were more than 20 commercial locations participating in these crimes. Now, you remember how I was bragging in front of the White House about attempting to create quality American jobs in the public sector? When I first traveled to Washington, D.C., my intention was not necessarily for protest. In fact, my first order of business was to visit the embassy for the Russian Federation and attempt to obtain a job as an analyst of U.S. federal policy. So the process of that application took several weeks, and I did, in fact, write several pieces of analysis for the Russian Federation. Now, eventually, they declined my offer, citing that the embassy there in Washington, D.C. had received an increased amount of attention from U.S. federal authorities in relation to my visits. During the process of application with the Russian Federation, I went ahead and came up with the idea for a protest, and my first move was to post on my website a request to the United States Department of Justice that the department acknowledge in writing that it had in fact denied to me equal protection under the law in 2012. I wasn't there in Washington, D.C. to ask for money, and I felt that, that to do so would actually degrade my presence and, and what it was that I was attempting to accomplish with my protest. Now, it was only later on that I decided to write for the Russian Federation a piece of analysis regarding the U.S. dollar. Now, I cannot disclose anything more about that idea because to do so might actually compromise the idea, and I'd hate to see my hard work go to waste. So if you've made it this far into my strange little film, you're either a law enforcement professional or you have a great penchant for arrogance. Either way, I'll go ahead and be the one to throw you a bone. Ready for this? Now, I told you I was headed to Washington, D.C. to job hunt, but what I didn't mention was that my first idea for a career was to become a practitioner of international law. With my specialty being U.S. federal policy, it made sense to approach the Russian Federation and ask them to put me through law school. Yeah, no, that's right. I, I wasn't joking. I actually did go to the Russian Federation and ask them to put me through law school, with the idea being that uh, my finding of fact would open the door for my presence in international court against the U.S. government pro se, and that I would spend the next three or four decades harassing the U.S. government in the international court. Surely some people believe my decision to approach the Russian Federation for Employment 
was an extreme one. However, when you put it in the context of events in that time frame, then it becomes a little more understandable. For example, my former employees months prior had elected to commandeer my remaining intellectual property, full well knowing that I was the federally registered trademark holder. And in light of my extensive communications with the United States Department of Justice prior to that point, it seems as though that decision must have been a government-approved one. My former employees were well aware of the fact that I would not have been able to access the court system for any type of defense of my intellectual property, because when I caught the American Bar Association slandering me in print, and that was March 2014, I served the bar with a demand for a very public correction of misinformation. Now, the bar, of course, did not respond favorably. However, we did have an extended exchange, and you can bet that it was done my way. I even made sure the ABA received a copy of the evidence from Adams County District Court proving that Judge Adalia A. Hill committed perjury to get me out of her courtroom. Months prior to the commandeering of my remaining intellectual property, my employees had witnessed my creation of nonprofit e-liquid. Now that was a revolutionary concept in the field of nicotine addiction because prior to that creation, there had never been a nonprofit manufacturer in the business of nicotine addiction. So which, which agency are you calling from? That is a and, uh, fraudulent account, I would think. I, I sure didn't open an account under Addison Specialty Services because I was not the CEO. I resigned as the CEO uh, before Christmas in 2013, and there's an attorney located on 14th and Grand in Spokane, Washington, who actually has a uh, statement to that effect that was signed in the, in the attorney's office with four members of the board of Addison Specialty Services. They can be found at, if you'd like a phone number. Sure. So I believe their new CEO is named Ryan Regan. So he's the gentleman that you wish to speak to on that matter. Uh, so it, I, okay. I have not actually been employed by the company even since uh, March, I believe, was my termination or resignation, whichever you want to call it, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, does this business, okay, so I'm, I am confused here and I do apologize. No problem. Let's no. go ahead and rehash that. Let me, let me go ahead and give you a, a more clear, perhaps, presentation. Uh, in 2013, I had amassed a debt with a Chinese national totaling about $80,000. At that point, he traveled to the United States to have established in his name a corporation called Addison Specialty Services, Inc. It was named after me because I had at the time some name recognition in the industry. So that was my way of repaying to this gentleman that former $80,000 debt. So I was at the time the uh, CEO, which I resigned from that position right around Christmas of 2013, and that's that can be found, evidence of that can be found at an attorney's office on 14th and Grand in Spokane, Washington. Okay. So on the DOR account that I pulled up, it says Lucky, Lucky Vapors Incorporated. How is that associated with that? Uh, if my name is if my name is on that application, that application is fraudulent, and whoever's operating that business should be charged with a felony. I do not work for that company. I've never worked for that company. I resigned from Addison Specialty Services, which was actually misnamed by the state of Washington as Addison Specialty Services, and that was that was March of of this year. Was right around the end of March was my resignation from the company. And that, was, that resignation was in response to 
felony criminal activity I observed as being committed against me by the employees of what is now, I guess, Lucky Vapors. And that felony activity was a conspiracy to commit violations against my uh, trademark protected intellectual property. So, and that's all been documented, but I don't actually have enough legal standing in the United States at this time to pursue any type of rights. And I've already documented that and turned it into a documentary at currently 69 minutes of length. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm just calling about the recording of workers' hours to your account here. Oh, okay. Well, so I'm, I'm reporting the fact on video to the state of Washington that there are felonies being committed and you're telling me about them right now because I have no business having my name on that, whatever you're calling about, that document. So in fact, okay. uh, I was the founder of the company which inspired the phone call, but if anybody's using any of that, uh, any number associated with that company at this time, that's a felony. And I really appreciate you reporting that to me. What is your name, dear? My name is Jennifer. And Jennifer, you were calling again from the Department of Revenue, was it? Labor and Industries. Labor and Industries. Okay, very good. I've always found my experiences with Labor and Industries to be that uh, you guys are pretty proactive. So hopefully you do something about this uh, felony activity because, you know, I mean, I can't do anything about it. But I've, I have put everything on the federal record if you need a citation for that. It's... 1 colon 1 3 CB 210 Reynolds Innovations Inc. v. Addison et al. in the Middle District of North Carolina. That would be great. The address, I believe, that you're looking for there is, uh, yeah, you've got the right place. I mean, that's the that's the store that I established for the gentleman in question. But again, I really appreciate you reporting this felony activity to me because somebody else called from a different department in the state of Washington a couple months ago, and uh, he was a little less than professional, so he just got the uh, the one finger salute in legalese, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Jennifer. And, and can you tell me uh, just real quickly, what exactly is the time and date? The time and date right now? Yes, please. Um, December 18th, 2014 at 9.42 a.m. You're a peach, dear. Have a great, great right. holiday season. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. <laughs> it's Lander! <laughs> Now, I guess it could be just a coincidence that my former employees decided to use my protected trademark property and my former tax information to launch their new business opportunity. And maybe it was even a coincidence that that all occurred only weeks after I sent this letter to the U.S. Department of Justice. However, my movie is filled with such coincidences. For example, only a few months after I sent to the Department of State this letter, the price of oil mysteriously went from $110 a barrel down to less than 45 Or, another coincidence, only months after I declared that I was going to seek asylum in Cuba, the U.S. Department of State mysteriously decides after 50 years they're going to open relations with Cuba. Go figure. Now you could bet your ass that if I went to Cuba for asylum, I would have set up a pirate radio station as close to the U.S. as possible so I could be pissing off U.S. federal officials all the way from sunny Cuba. This is Chance Camel Slayer Addison checking in from Holland. I'm going for asylum. I love this place. I'm voting with my tax dollars not to participate in the criminal enterprise known as the U.S. government. Now it can be proven with information in the public space that the U.S. government, according to its own laws, is a criminal organization guilty of war crimes crimes against humanity, and consistent violations of the constitutionally protected rights of the residents of the lands under its control. I've proven that in court. I'm voting, therefore, with my tax dollars to become a part of Holland, if they will let me. Thank you. Is there a reason why you need to have me step out of the car, sir? 
Yeah, we just got a complaint of drug use here. There's no drug use here. And there's no probable cause for you to harass me and ask me to step out of my car. And you might remember that I accused the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police of intentionally harassing me in my parking spot behind the Russian Federation. I'm getting harassed simply for the Why fact that I live in my vehicle. I live in my vehicle and I got a choice parking spot, sir. I mean, this is a, this is a spot that doesn't require a parking permit. There's no signage on the street. So, I mean, and it's in the shade, so... I mean, it's a pretty choice parking spot. This is the for my first few weeks in the District of Columbia, I parked behind the Embassy for the Russian Federation, using their cameras to enhance my own personal security. Now, on one occasion, when the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police decided to harass me in the middle of the night, I was smart enough to turn on my smartphone. Because I'm a homeless guy, I lost my business as a, as a direct result of the fact that the U.S. DOJ committed a violation of the principle of equal protection against me. In addition to a complete retelling of the events which led to my presence in the district, the officer on that night also got an education on certain points of the law. And creating the le legal designation of sovereign entity, not citizen entity. I looked at the, uh, the rules regarding citizenship and the renunciation thereof and realized that no one had ever, apparently, renounced citizenship based upon the criminal acts committed against them by public officials. So I went ahead and created that designation and then lucky for me, the 316th largest company in this country sued me about five months later. That's R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. So I went ahead and started learning how to practice law. And use of sarcasm in professional context. Oh, if, you'd like to, right if you'd like to offer me personal advice, I prefer you first prove that you have the necessary credentials and I'm not convinced. Oh, I, I do. I'm, I'm like a A badge and a gun doesn't count. So that being said, um, what I do now is I come up with I come up with creative ways of marketing my my talents and one of the things that that I can do quite well is uh, I'm competent well, in the analysis of various areas of U.S. federal policy. Well, so I've been writing talk, ideas can I for talk the Russians. For a minute, though, I just want to tell you our story. Sure. Okay. We're gonna keep getting called. I know. Right. I know. So I know. So you're gonna keep. It, and I'm gonna uh, keep begging the Russians for a job. And well, if yeah. they'll give me one, I'll get the hell out of here, well, stat. I swear. It's not her. I, I I've been calling. I've been knocking on their door at least once a week, and I write down ideas for analysis for how high quality. American jobs can be created in the public sector. I give them ideas on a regular basis with the hopes that they'll see that I'm actually serious about wanting to work and have the talents necessary to perform some activity for the Russians so I can get the hell out of here because why, I don't why, have any options. Why the Russians? Who else is going to have the guts to hire me? You tell me. You tell me who the fuck's going to have the guts to hire me. Please. I'll go there and apply. I'll have to read your story and then I'll tell you. <laughs> Let me give you my card, sir. Ugh. And please don't tear apart my car. There is no fucking... The only thing you're going to find in there if you, if you got a fucking drug dog is that in Washington State, guns is legal. So yeah, there was a ton of gun smoke in this car, but there is nothing in here. Why? Don't you think I knew that you guys would be stopping by on a regular basis? Come on. The last remaining shreds of my business were destroyed with the arrival of a lawsuit emanating from Reynolds Innovations, subsidiary to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company of North Carolina. Now, this was about uh, maybe a year after I'd first contacted the United States Department of Justice regarding the initial crimes which destroyed the value of my products. Consequently, by 2014... I wasn't concerned with the types of materials I was submitting to the court system, but instead was looking to create quality American jobs within the Justice Department. Therefore, I wrote some entertaining poetry. For one, my, uh, my personal favorite. Let me borrow your eyes. I promise to satisfy. For the view from your precipice is a sight I wish not to miss. Your position affords leverage. Grave obligations neglected. To a gilded invitation responds the desires of a nation. For the record started long ago, long before this row we hoe. Now snowed in by sudden winter, your frozen bones begin to sliver. And as these shards are collected, forming art presumed rejected, intimidation with intention, for policy breeds such dissension. 
And the history of all solutions proves the rarity of evolution and predicts eminent failure. For fascism is not the answer. Pretty fucking annoying, huh? Tonight I want to speak to you about what the United States will do with our friends and allies to degrade and ultimately destroy the terrorist group known as ISIL. And nobody likes having people laughing at them after they've made a serious mistake. But of course, I was in Washington, D.C. to be the most annoying man possible. Therefore, on the night when President Obama was addressing the nation and making his case for taking on ISIS in Syria and Iraq, it's a, it's a quagmire. If you... I was busy making fun of the fact that the Internal Revenue Service had recently lost a bunch of very suspicious emails on a hard drive. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Flawless victory. Now the question isn't, was I too annoying? Good morning, gentlemen. I'd like to tell you all about the alternative uses for Federal Reserve notes. The question really is, was I annoying enough? Good morning, sir. 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 And it isn't. Did I make coming to work too hard for those heroic government employees? Hello, sir. I'd like to teach you something about the Federal Reserve. Sir, I'd like to teach you something about the Federal Reserve. Gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. It's how much harder is Abby's life going to be without her dad around? Now, often people have asked me, what do you feel you've accomplished with your protest in front of the White House? Well, I did have hundreds of people join me there flying the bird. And I had thousands express a you know, real positive reaction to what was going on there. But at the end of the day, I have no idea what I accomplished. It's probably not even in my hands. Or is it? Pretty fucking annoying, huh? Yeah. In the cost of manufacture, I actually make it more valuable with the application of my website because on my website, it's likely to learn something useful to you. It's not going to cost you anything, and I don't generate any revenue from it. It's a, it's a quagmire. It's a quagmire. It's a quagmire. However, several months later, I had not yet heard back from the mis municipality. However, several months later, I had not yet heard back from the muni. However, several months later, I had not yet heard back from the municipality. This is probably a good time for some corrections and additions. So you remember how I was... Fuck. 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 I don't remember how I was. Of course, in addition to receiving my 270 port... Of course, in addition to receiving my 274 page legal brief, the DC Metropolitan Parking blah 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 blah. What the fuck are they anyway? Let's find out, shall we? I'm gonna have to check my own letter. And yes, the feedback is intentional. Why? Because it's fucking annoying. How are you gonna celebrate 9-11? After all, it was your employer that was involved. Obama needs a sign to let him know we're here. So take your fingers, raise them up, and pierce the atmosphere. He needs to know that things are really fucked up. It's like an ugly video where he's two girls and we're the cup. I'm even wearing a special sign. Woo! Hey, I love you. 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 I love you.
Mr. Obama. Yeah! <laughs> I love you. Yeah. You got a special present from the Birdman today. You. I love him too. I love him. I love him I this love you. much. Set them free. Whoa, this is a solution. It's time to be flipping, flipping, flipping. Flip off the White House. This is as fun as the ducks, I swear. I can't take those dumb bastards of the USDOJ and left me out here to develop this little hill. Kevin Vidal on guitar. United States Department of Justice, I came up with my pitch for the alternative uses for Federal Reserve notes. And after a couple of Sundays passed without seeing my little girl, I decided to make coming to work a living hell for the staff of the executive building and the White House. All right, here we go. Here's another couple of guys that look like they need to learn something about the Federal Reserve. You ready? Gentlemen, can I teach you something about the Federal Reserve? Did you know that the Federal Reserve cannot prove that this dollar is backed with anything? I've actually proven this as a pro se litigant in two separate federal jurisdictions against two different tobacco companies. The argument goes like this. Because the U.S. Federal Reserve cannot prove that there's anything backing this particular dollar bill here, 
I've therefore made it more valuable with the application of my website because on my website it's likely you'll learn something useful to you about the law, it's not going to cost you anything, and I don't generate any revenue from it. So I'm actually invoking from the rules of federal procedure 103 subdivision C which states that if information exists in the public space, it's therefore usable at your trial. I want to thank you gentlemen for your time. Have a nice day. See, these guys don't like me, but they can't stop me because I'm actually telling the truth. About a week after my arrival in Washington, D.C., I had succeeded in developing a very annoying protest, but I still needed a method for attracting more attention from visitors to the White House. Lying at the White House, I will reach up to the stars. Hopefully Obama's working, not golfing out on bars. By the bird, it feels grand. Come fly the bird, show your hands. <laughs> After I had developed my parody songs featuring Obama as the subject, I had no trouble being recognized all over Washington, D.C. Raise it up and flying out the White House. I'll raise it up for all the world to see. Criminals, they rule the U.S. government. Now words in silence never will be free. My business was destroyed by a failure to act on the part of the Spokane Police Department and a failure to uphold equal protection under the law by the United States Department of Justice. And that business was the only tool I had to be able to get across the state of Washington to see my kiddo. I drove across the state of Washington hundreds of times to see Abby. Consequently, I wasn't really concerned with how difficult I might have made life for employees of the White House and the Dwight D. Eisenhower Executive Building. What brought me here was a very long chain of events that start in 2009 when I first discovered that I had been exposed to large amounts of uranium and strontium. That was discovered through an elemental hair test in July of 2009. So I decided to start studying closely U.S. federal policy to, you know, try to learn about the U.S. government because I figured that would have been the most likely source of my exposure. These elements don't exist in nature at sufficient levels, or even at all, to, uh, you know, suggest that, uh, that I would be naturally exposed to that type of level of radioactivity. Now, everybody has some radioactivity in their bodies based on the fact that there's been tons of atmospheric testing, you know, ever since the devices were first developed. But that being said, my exposure is about 80 times higher than what you would expect to see. So, one of the things that I ended up studying was the nuclear industry. And I posted a piece online in 2011 where I evaluate the industry and determined that the U.S. federal government's actually giving to the nuclear industry about $2.5 billion a month in subsidies. This is, comes in the form of uh, cleanup activities, securement, research, you know, paying out settlements when people were injured, like active duty soldiers that were exposed to radiation, things like that. And, and by this point, I had written my first book about U.S. federal policy. Uh, that's when America's intelligence community became actively involved in my life, it appears, for uh, most of my former contacts were intimidated into not maintaining contact with me. So I... In uh, 2012... Months later, when my business was still being destroyed by crimes committed against me that the Spokane Police Department refused to investigate, I resorted to video stings. So, it's exactly the same? Yeah, just, yeah it's the same. They just kind of changed. Okay. Now, one of these video stings resulted in a watered-down confession from one of the conspirators, but it was far more than enough to bury the masterminds, and still the United States Department of Justice refused to make contact with me, even after I served them with the evidence. This is the part where I began stamping Federal Reserve notes as a way of protesting. 
Now the first website which received such attention was my killedbypolice.com website and that was launched in direct response to the Spokane Police Department's failure to act in 2012. So in 2013 when a Fortune 500 company came knocking on my door with a lawsuit this fucking big, I didn't have money for an attorney. So I had to practice law for myself. All right, so everybody knows that the Federal Reserve is printing worthless paper, so they can't prove it's worth anything more than the cost of manufacture. Therefore, I have successfully argued in two federal jurisdictions that with the application of my website on this bill, it becomes more valuable because on my website, it's likely you'll learn something useful to you about the law. It's not gonna cost you anything, and I don't generate any revenue from it. So, I actually submitted two samples to two different federal jurisdictions, explaining to them under penalty of perjury that I have in fact stamped 200,000 of these bills and ran around buying money orders to get them in circulation as a means by which to use Federal Rule of Procedure 103 Subdivision C, which states essentially, if information exists in the public space, then it can be used at your trial. Now, if I were wrong, would I still be out here 19 days Five hours a day, flipping off the White House? You tell me. When I first began protesting at the White House, I stood quietly at the fence line, smiling and flying the bird. However, after a couple more weeks of living on the streets while being ignored by the United Brief on the public record, which goes like this. The U.S. government and all resulting jurisdictions, in the absence of a human claimant to constitutionally protected rights, does not have jurisdiction over my person because I can prove that the U.S. government is guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and consistent violations of the constitutionally protected rights of the residents of the lands under its control, and I can do this using evidence produced exclusively by the U.S. government. I didn't set out to become a threat to the national security of the United States of America in the practice of pro se law. In fact, I was forced into the discipline of pro se law based on a lack of resources and that was a direct result of a failure to act on the part of a member of the Spokane Police Force. When I made my first report to the Spokane Police Department about crimes committed against my business in 2012, I didn't just notify the Spokane Police Department. I also notified the city's attorney, the U.S. attorney, the mayor's office, and the city council. But I didn't stop there. I contacted the police ombudsman. When the police ombudsman refused to act, I addressed city council. When city council did nothing, I posted a video online comprised of evidence I had collected. Love it. I sent the first check out and he texted me back saying, hey, I sent the order out, but you have to remake the check out. To... And that check was made out on January 10th, um, 2012. And that check number was 2222. Yeah. The first one I voided was January 5th, 2012, and it was for $265. And then I got emails saying that, you know, he was no longer with you, but he was a salesman, so he had um, extra product left over. February 13th, 2012, at 3.45 p.m., I said, I saw your email. Do you have any more batteries or stuff you want to sell and get rid of. I may buy some off yet. And he says, I'll email you what I can do, Ralph. And that was at 2.13. advice would I have for someone who wants to take on the U.S. federal government in court, playing by their rules? Don't expect to leave the conflict with anything other than maybe a good time. By the bird, it feels grand. Come fly the bird, show your hands. <laughs> and don't think for a 
second that you're going to be the first person to use information released to the world by Manning, Snowden, or Assange as a way to challenge the U.S. government's claim to jurisdiction over your person, because I was probably the first person to do that, August 2013. Now, before you use data released to the world by Snowden, Manning, or Assange as a means by which you might fight against the U.S. government's claim to jurisdiction over your person, you should take note of the fact that the U.S. government is likely to label you as a domestic terrorist if you try this type of argument in federal court. Ma'am, if you protest loudly against the duplicitous nature of the legal system maintained by the United States Department of Justice, and then get lucky enough to get sued by a large publicly traded company, you too might find yourself hanging out in front of the White House protesting. Often people come up to me and ask me, what are you doing? So this is what I'm telling them now. What I'm doing when I fly the bird is I'm circumventing the NSA's ability to suppress data online. While the US does offer the most freedom of personal expression, we actually do not have a very free press. We're only rated number 48th in the world for our freedom of press. The US government engages heavily in censorship. So freedom of expression personally and freedom of the press are actually two separate issues. And specifically, I am trying to keep a legal